we continue on open fellowship error. We're continuing to talk about open fellowship uh, as a theme. There's quite a few things to talk about, but uh, I'm looking at, I'm still looking at the subheading of claimed reality. Uh, put reality in quotations and do air quotes as well uh, because of the, uh, well, because of my long time service in the Department of Redundancy Department, but also so as to be clear that uh, this is not my thing. This is not my doing. <laughs> I do not claim that this is less than clear. Uh, it is the uh, opponents of God who say that it is less than clear. It is the opponents of God who are appealing to quote-unquote reality. Um, and again, this boils down to an appeal to what people are doing or have done. You can observe, uh, you can observe certain behaviors in the churches and between uh, Christians over time and over history. And, and, you know, I'm not here to say they did do this or they didn't do this. Uh, I'm here to say, who cares what they did? What does the Bible say? That's really what it's about. If you are looking at what people have done, um, you know, that's too much um, trust in people and instead of in God and in his word. Uh, you know, we said before, perhaps your uh, parents are Christians, and I hope that they are because it's a great blessing and that's good, but, but mine were not. And uh, so, you know, it's not any good for me to look at what gen my generations did before me or what my parents did in terms of religion. There's no reason to do that. I've got to go to the Bible. Um, but we also know that God doesn't have grandchildren. So even if your parents were Christians, you still need to go to the Bible too. Um, if we go the other route and say, well, this is what people have done or what people are doing. I mean, that's going down a route of, uh, you know, putting the blame on the Bible or putting the blame on the God who wrote the Bible. Um, and I can show you how. Here's an example. Um, from a fella named Ed Harold, who, by the way, I don't, I did not know him. Um, I know he has passed away. I'm not here to uh, curse the dead or make any kind of personal uh, attacks. I did not know the fella. He seemed like a nice guy, um, charming and humorous from what I have seen in his speeches and in his, uh, in the videos and things of this nature. It is not about this fella. I am quoting him because he's very influential. And his teaching, it seems very clear to me in uh, studying and reading these things, has become the de facto standard in the churches. So that's why I'm quoting this for you. And I think that uh, you'll recognize some of the things that are asserted. So uh, one of the things he said uh, was the bounds of Christian unity require judgments about the clarity of biblical instruction. Uh, bounds of Christian unity means where do you draw lines of fellowship? He said we have to make judgments about the clarity of biblical instruction. Well, why is that? Well, because in his way of thinking, people are not doing what it says, and they mean well, so therefore it must be unclear. And if we're going to decide whether or not to remain in fellowship with that person, we're going to have to decide how clear we think the Bible is about this topic before we draw lines. If we think that it's kind of unclear, then okay, we can agree to disagree and get along. That's how the churches operate. Um, that's not what the Bible says, but that's what the churches are doing. I think he accurately captures that. So, again, he wrote, Those who love and respect God and who sustain their beliefs with biblical argument do not always agree. Such a confession acknowledges a variability in biblical clarity. Um, that's where we have a problem. See, he says they love and respect God, and maybe that's true, but he says they sustain their beliefs with biblical argument. Well, that's a little overwrought, don't you think? 
it's not biblical argument, it's what does the Bible say? <laughs> Such a confession acknowledges the variability of biblical clarity. That is, if we confess that people who love and respect God and who both appeal to the Bible for authority do not agree. Therefore, what? Right. That's the issue. Therefore, if you're at Harrell, there's a variability in biblical clarity. As in, the reason why these people disagree is because the Bible cannot be understood. That's what he's saying, right? But that is incorrect. There's another reason why they disagree. Also, he wrote, one can only speculate about why God left us in such an unsettled predicament. So to his way of thinking, the churches are in an unsettled predicament because they're always looking for the truth. They're never able. And yes, I put seek on that one because I'm, I'm afraid to put that on the screen without, without some kind of distance between me and that. <laughs> uh, that's, I'm afraid of saying something like that. No, I don't think that God left us in an unsettled predicament in the churches trying to figure out what it is that he wants us to do. Uh, I don't accept any of that. What this comes down to, again, is the same thing that we talked about last time. It is fear. People are afraid that they're going to get it wrong. That's what it comes down to. I can accept that they love and, re and respect God and, and that they do appeal to the Bible. I think that the problem is they're afraid. They don't think that they can understand it or they think that if they want to understand it and, and bind it, um, you know, apply it, that they're going to get it wrong. And that fear is causing them to draw back and not bind it and, and not apply it uh, and not have uh, people, I guess, divided or you know, drawing some lines of this is right and this is wrong. Um, that's fear is what it is, unfortunately. And in the, in the final analysis of fear, if you're looking at the uh, the children of Israel is wandering in the wilderness, um, which we are. The final analysis of that is we don't believe that we are so great or intelligent or powerful or whatever to understand and to take this to, to heart and to use it. We believe that God is so great and powerful that he can help us to understand it, that he can give us a word that we can understand. This salvation is for his name's sake. We can be saved, but with man it's impossible. With God it's possible. All things are possible. This is the issue. So don't be afraid. Our God is a powerful God, and he can save us, and he can help us to overcome. Now, when it comes to this assertion that biblical clarity is variable, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't accept that um, for a lot of reasons. But let's uh, let's say, in summary, that there are not things you need to do to be saved that cannot be understood. There are not teachings about what the church ought to be and do and practice that cannot be understood. Now, you may have questions, and I may have questions about the Bible, about some passage, or, uh, some aspect, or, or something of some verse. You know, did this apply to that, or did, did he have this thing in mind? You know, yeah, but that's that's not the issue here, and that's not an issue, and nobody is splitting churches over such matters. We're talking about what is right and what is wrong. That's never unclear in Scripture. So Korah's rebellion um, is a thing to look at. It's in number 16, but the question, again, is clarity. Is there biblical clarity? And again, our focus on Korah is, um, you know, kind of the secondary thing. This is the outcome or the, 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 the consequence of what happened earlier. So don't lose your place, I guess, in the big picture. 
But today, we're talking about clarity with regard to the rebellion. First thing that we look at is the priesthood of Aaron, because that's what's at issue. In number 16, when Korah, Dathan, and Abiram assembled with a whole bunch of leaders, well-known persons, they assembled against Moses and Aaron and said, You have gone too far. All in the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. When they said this, what they meant specifically is that every tribe can have priests, not just Judah. Every family can have priests, not just Levi. Or, um, uh, I'm sorry, not just Levi. Not, uh, yeah, every tribe can have priests, not just Levi. Every family can have priests, not just Aaron. That's where he's going. So the reason they've assembled these people is they're bringing uh, representatives, you know, heads of households from every tribe who are coming forth to serve as priests. They don't, they, they're saying it can't just be Aaron. Why are they saying this? Well, again, uh, in the big picture, they're saying this because they were not willing to take the promised land in Numbers 14. They believed that they couldn't do it. And when they were cursed and uh, condemned to this wandering in the wilderness, this comes up. Now they say, hey, you know, um, this word that came down came through one, you know, administration, Moses and Aaron. And you know, they're brothers too. So that kind of smells like corruption to me. The way to deal with this is democratize it. And this, this is what they're doing. That's how they're coming forward. And what they're saying here is you guys have gone far enough. You're, you think you're running the show. You're lording it over everybody. Right. The, everybody is holy. The Lord is among them. So they're saying any tribe can be priests. First question is, was God clear about Aaron being the priest? Right. <laughs> Let's examine the biblical clarity here. Exodus 27 and 28. You shall command the people, says the Lord to Moses, that they bring to you pure beaten olive oil for the light. A lamp may regularly be set up to burn in the tent of meeting outside the veil that is before the testimony. Aaron and his sons will tend it from evening to morning before the Lord. It will be a statute forever to be observed throughout their generations by the people of Israel. Then bring near to you Aaron, your brother and his sons with him from among the people of Israel to serve me as priests. Who? Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. <laughs> Is there confusion about this? Has he been less than clear? Let's see. Hmm. Who brings the offerings? The people. Hmm. Where do they bring it? The tent of meeting. Who stays at the tent of meeting and attends it? Aaron and his sons. How long does this last forever throughout their generations? Who is brought near? Aaron and who and his sons? The brother of Moses, yes. From among the people to serve as priests. Who is that again? Aaron. Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, Ithamar. All right, so where is the lack of clarity in this passage? Does this seem unclear? Can this be not understood? Why do you think that Korah and the others were saying priests could arise from any tribe, not just Aaron, not just Levi? Is it because God's message was unclear? Exodus 28, for Aaron's sons, you shall make coats and sashes and caps for glory and for beauty and put them on Aaron, your brother and his sons with him and anoint them 
and ordain them and consecrate them, that they may serve me as priests, which is a statute forever for him and his offspring after him. All right, so who is anointed, consecrated, <laughs> set apart, called from among the people? Aaron and his sons. How long forever for him and his offspring? Oops, 29, verse 1 of Exodus, this is what you shall do to them to consecrate them, that they may serve me as priests. And there's a whole bunch of things, but 7 through 9 especially says, take the anointing oil, pour it on his head, anoint him, bring his sons and put coats on them, and gird Aaron and sons with sashes and bind caps on them, and the priesthood will be theirs by a statute forever. Thus you shall ordain Aaron and his sons. Okay. Anybody else? Hmm. No, no, no mention of that. 2944, the Lord says, I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. Aaron also and his sons I will consecrate to serve me as priests. Okay, so it seems obvious then that uh, Korah and the others just were confused about this and needed to have some patience and, uh, you know, some studies to go over what God said about this because, you know, they were good men. They were respected by the congregation, you think? How's that play out for you? Seem all right? Hebrews 7, 11 to 14, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood under which the people received the law of Moses, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek. Which is to say, why would the psalm, written hundreds of years later, make reference to a priesthood of Melchizedek? The point Hebrews is making is we have a new priesthood in Christ Jesus. But listen to his rationale. That's the point we need today. Why would you need another priest after an order of Melchizedek rather than one named after the order of Aaron? For when there's a change in priesthood, there must be a change in law, too. Because the one about whom these things are spoken belonged to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. It's evident our Lord Jesus was descended from Judah. And in connection with Judah, Moses said nothing about priests. Okay. Well, Jesus is the priest. He's the high priest, but it's the order of Melchizedek. He's not Aaronical. He's not from Levi. He is from Judah. But the point in Hebrews is that can't be the same law because in the law of Moses, there's only one priesthood and that's Aaron. Jesus can't be serving under the law of Moses because He's descended from Judah. So again, the Lord put forth who would be the priest, who would serve him. Was he less than clear about that? <laughs> was Moses less than clear about that and what was put forth? Was there confusion about what family, what tribe, what sons? Is there anything about this that did not that was not clear? No, no, nah, I would say no, that's not the problem. So, the other thing that's happening here in Korah's rebellion is that God gets to make a choice. That's what's happening. As Korah comes forward and says, no, nope, Moses is not right. This law, basically saying this law that he gave us is not the binding law, it's not real. Because that law is very clear about what is required and what is allowed. So God makes a choice between them. That's what happens. Uh, number 16, 16 to 17, Moses told Korah, You be present and all your company before the Lord, you and they, and Aaron tomorrow. So let's bring all of you who say you are priests before the Lord. Let God choose. Let every one of you take a censer and put incense on it. Every one of you bring before the Lord his censer. 250 censers, as in this man um, uh, mustered 250 priests. 
You also on Aaron, each his censer. So they're going to appear before God, and God is going to choose. That's what they're saying. The 20th verse continues, The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. This was said earlier, but uh, you get the point. God is angry about this. Why is he so angry about this? Well, it's his law, and they refuse to keep it. They refused to go into the promised land, and now they refuse to listen to his authority. They won't follow the scriptures. The Lord is angry and tells Moses and Aaron, separate yourselves from this congregation. I will consume them in a moment. And they fell on their faces, Moses and Aaron did, and said, God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin and you will be angry with all the congregation. They're interceding on behalf of the people. And the Lord spoke to Moses, say to the congregation, get away from the dwelling of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. So the intercession is, not everybody has done wrong. And the Lord said, tell the congregation to get away from Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. What does that do? Well, it separates the righteous from the unrighteous, the just from the unjust. Those who want to stand with Korah and his priests are going to stand right there with him in opposition to the Lord. When Moses speaks on behalf of the Lord, he's the authority of the word of God, if you will. And if God says to them, get away, and they don't do it, well, that tells you those are not God's people. They're not listening to him. In the 28th verse, Moses told everybody, Hereby you shall know the Lord has sent me to do all these works, and that it has not been of my own accord. So the Lord is going to make a choice. They appear before the Lord, and Moses lays out this idea. You will know the Lord has sent me to do all the stuff that I am doing. It has not been of my own accord. You know, Jesus said something very similar in John 7. You know, whoever w wants to do the will of God will know concerning this teaching, whether I speak on my own authority or whether it is of God. It's a very similar idea. Here in number 16, the very point is this. Moses is, in fact, speaking what God intended, what God said to him. But Korah does not accept that. He thinks Moses is making things up or embellishing or altering. He thinks the word of God is corrupted before it gets to him. As in, he thinks that the Bible is not clear. That it has somehow been corrupted. It has been put through filters or translators or some, in some way it has been um, affected so that we can't understand it. That's what Korah thinks. And Moses is saying, look at the signs that God is doing. This tells you that he sent me to do these things. I did not do this of my own accord. It's, Moses is not acting on his own. He really does represent what God told him to represent. That's what we're saying here. Because Korah thinks Moses made this up. Moses is saying, no, God, I'm doing what God told me to do. And here is the sign. Now, as soon as he finished speaking these words, the ground underneath Korah and Dathan and Abiram split apart, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and the people who belonged to Korah and everything they owned. So they and all that belonged to them went down alive into the grave, and the earth closed over them, and they perished from the midst of the assembly. And fire came out from the Lord, 
and consumed the 250 men offering the incense. Um, so, again, we, we said this is not Moses' is doing, and it's not. Moses hasn't got the power to open the earth and to swallow an entire company of people. The Lord God has that power. So the ground underneath them splits, the earth opens its mouth and swallows them whole, and their households, everything they own, goes down into the grave alive. It's like this idea of this thing just split open and they went down. They were killed from the middle of the assembly. That is, they were in the church saying these nasty things and they got swept away immediately by the Lord. After intercession was made for the people, because this was about to happen to everybody. Remember? Get away from this congregation. I will consume them in a moment. So that's not what happened. He only consumed the subset of them who were with Korah in a moment. And fire came out from the Lord and consumed the men offering the incense. And what I, the reason I'm, I'm doing some of these excerpts and putting the emphasis where I am is to ask again the question, was God clear about this? Was he clear that Aaron was the priest? I think he was. And now, is he clear what his choice has been? Who is right and who is wrong? Is he clear about this? In number 17, verse 5, the Lord told Moses, The staff of the man whom I choose will sprout. He gave, they all gave their staffs. Every, um, a representative of every tribe gave staffs. And on the next day, Moses went into the tent of the testimony, and behold, the staff of Aaron for the house of Levi had sprouted and put forth buds and produced blossoms and it bore ripe almonds. This is, you know, of course, that's a process that would take a season, not overnight, and not with not on some stick sitting in a box. It would be on a live, uh, you know, planted, watered, tended, uh, you know, produce kind of deal. This is a miracle. <laughs> and and so then somebody would say, well, Moses put them in there and Moses took them out of there too. Yeah, okay, yes. But uh, if you read the details of number 17, and I didn't supply them here, all these people came together and they marked their sticks. They're identifiable. You know that that's the one that was placed into the box. Um, so very clear, I should say. Aaron's house is the one. That's what God has chosen. So again, the reason for bringing these uh, details in, in this particular uh, sermon here is to show that the Lord was very clear about who should be a priest. This question that was brought up by Korah, which is not really what it's about. It's not about what it seems to be about, right? But this question about who should be the priest didn't arise from a lack of biblical clarity. That came from somewhere else entirely. And now you can see by the actions that happened, how God said, I'll, I'll destroy all of them. And Moses and Aaron interceded. Now he'll destroy only those who side with Korah. And then the ground opens and swallows them alive. That's not something Moses can do. And then the, uh, the staff or the sticks uh, that the heads of father's households put forward, you know, were dead, sticks, barren, but clearly marked individually so that everybody knew that was the one. And Aaron's came back with a complete productive process of an almond on it where the others were bare sticks. So it was clear that God made a choice in this matter. He did a thing, he did these miracles to indicate what his choice had actually been. And again, um, I, you know, I'll 
point out one more time. I think that um, you know verse that verse uh, thirty one of number sixteen. I think this is the real. Uh, or I'm sorry, uh, twenty. I'm sorry, twenty eight. That this is the real center of the issue. Did Moses speak on his own authority when he said these words? Or was it really God? Even if you might think that it looked like Moses did this. It looked like Moses was being self-serving. And it looked like Moses was uh, showing favoritism to a family member, his brother. Maybe that's what you think. But is the reality that that's what Moses did? Or is the reality that God spoke through him? And these words are not Moses' words, they're God's words. That's the real question. That's what this whole thing is about. All of the attacks on God's word saying that, well, you know, Christians disagree, therefore the Bible is unclear. No, that's not the case. The problem is not everybody is accepting that the scripture can and must be understood. Not everybody is accepting that what was written indeed is God's word, not man's. In the same way that Korah did. And I'm afraid that the end of such persons is the same as Korah's. Now, we'll close in Psalm 133 because in opposition to this supposed reality where you look at how people have always done wrong and therefore God cannot be understood. That, that's false. Yeah, people have always done wrong. But why is that God's fault? Um, in contrast to that, we look instead at Psalm 133 where there is a real biblical unity. The Bible does speak of unity, and it is a good thing. It is the song of ascents of David. What is a song of ascents? Well, it's a song that is sung while you are ascending the hill to Jerusalem. It means you are on your way to worship God. Or it may be a song that is sung as people are arriving while they are ascending the hill to worship at the temple in Jerusalem. And he says, Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. There the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. But I note again, that the psalm said this dwelling in unity is like the oil of anointing for the priesthood of Aaron. When you realize that, you know, number 16 is there, that Korah and his company are there, that thousands of people died, uh, how do you say that the anointing of Aaron is like the beauty and the preciousness of brotherly unity. But the unity is, is not based on people agree to disagree. It's not based on people going along. It's based on what God said, what God put forth. And in fact, Aaron saved alive many of the people Though Korah and his company died, those who were innocent did not die because Aaron and Moses interceded on their behalf. So even while he was being attacked for being priest, he was still performing his priestly duty of saving the people, which is, of course, symbolic of Jesus. But you see this 
anointing. It means it's the choice of God. We read earlier how he said, you will take this oil, you will pour it on Aaron, on his sons. This becomes them, their uh, priesthood forever. That's the meaning. It is the unity. It's good and pleasant when brothers dwell in unity, like the oil of the anointing of Aaron, like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. Uh, Hermon is a mountain at the farthest north edge of the Israelite territory, and Jerusalem is in the far south, where Zion, Mount Zion, that's the far south. So he's, this is the border, if you will, the northern and the southern borders, the farthest extents of the Israelite territory. So the dew of Hermon falls on the mountains of Zion, meaning the blessing <laughs> Uh, and Zion, for that matter, is next to the Dead Sea, uh, you know, where Hermon is next to the Sea of Gennesaret, the Tiberias. You know. So there's um, the dew of Hermon blesses Mount Zion, just saying that that whole country that they took, the promised land, again, in retrospect, they didn't want to go into the promised land that generation. And then the next generation that did go didn't do everything they were supposed to either. They were afraid because the enemy had iron chariots. We'll talk about that later. But this is where the Lord has commanded the blessing life forevermore. Life is for those who will conquer, those who will not let fear stop us from going forward with the work of the Lord God. We believe that God can get a word to us that we can understand. We believe that we can obey him and be right with him and that we can be saved and that others can be saved simply by heeding the word of God, listening to what he teaches. So today, if you are not a Christian, you do understand what God wants for you in this world. We will help you to obey him in baptism for forgiveness of your sins being buried together with Jesus in water you are resurrected you look forward to a resurrection together with Jesus in the spirit if today as a Christian you have not lived right repent make things right with God let us help you with our prayers on your behalf but brethren do not be afraid believe in God who can save for his name's sake it isn't about us and how powerful or strong or great we are it is about the god who said these things and who makes things happen by saying it he spoke light into existence he created us as first fruits in his son jesus and he'll keep going if we'll let him if you need to obey the gospel if you need the prayers of the saints please let your need be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected